Thanks, uh, Dr. Garrett, and uh, thanks everyone for coming out again on this dreary and wet night, but uh, appreciate you, you guys all being here. Um, so as Dr. Garrett mentioned, my talk is entitled What You Need to Know About High Blood Pressure. So it's basically an uh, overview of the basics and the fundamentals of high blood pressure or hypertension. And uh, speakers following me will get into some of the specifics as <laughs> it relates to stroke and kidney disease. So I think it, it's a good place to start to define what is high blood pressure. You know, we throw around that term hypertension or high blood pressure, but not all of, all of us here may know what exactly is high blood pressure. And the definition has actually changed somewhat in recent years. Um, up until 2017, so just, you know, less than two years ago, high blood pressure as outlined in the red um, square on the left side, was defined as a systolic blood pressure, which is the top number, above 140, or a diastolic pressure, which is the bottom number, above 90. So 140 over 90 was kind of the cutoff for high blood pressure. And that was the case for about 15 years or so. And in 2017, uh, for kind of multiple reasons, the guidelines and the definition of high blood pressure actually changed. And the threshold became lower. So now, high blood pressure is actually defined as a systolic blood pressure, again, the top number, being more than 130, and the bottom number, or the diastolic pressure, being 80 or more. So 130 over 80 instead of 140 over 90. Um, as you can see, in both kind of definitions, the normal definition of blood pressure remained the same. Less than 120 over 80 is still considered normal. Um, there's this gray area, so to speak, between 120 and 130 that's considered elevated blood pressure, or they used to call it prehypertension, borderline blood pressure, you know, whatever the term that you want to use. But 130 over 80 is kind of the number that um, you know, uh, you guys should have in mind. And the other thing that I will say about blood pressure readings, one high, blood pr one high pressure reading doesn't necessarily mean you have high blood pressure. The um, recommendation and actually the, the guideline is to take at least two readings on two separate occasions and um, average those. So it gives you a more accurate representation of the blood pressure trend as opposed to just looking at one number. <clears throat> as I'm sure all of you know, you know, if you go to the doctor's office and you're rushing, dealing with traffic, you're, you may be anxious to see, to be in the office, when they first check your blood pressure, your readings may be 20, 30 points higher than what you check at home. And that happens not uncommonly. So why does high blood pressure matter? Uh, with the most recent definition of high blood pressure of anything more than 130 over 80, actually almost 50% of US adults have high blood pressure currently. And as Dr. Gary mentioned in the intro, high blood pressure is a huge burden on not only patients, but the overall healthcare system. And um, you know, 46% of US adults, that equates to almost 150 million people in this country alone, never mind uh, worldwide. And in the US, high blood pressure accounted for more cardiovascular disease deaths. That's things like death from heart attack and strokes and heart failure um, than any other modifiable risk factor and was second only to smoking as a preventable cause of death for any reason. So high blood pressure is all around us. Um, you know, if you, don't high, if you don't have high blood pressure yourself, you probably know at least one person who has it. <clears throat> so this slide, I'll kind of break down in uh, the upcoming slides in more detail, but basically it just talks about the risk factors that, is common in, that are common in patients with high blood pressure. And these risk factors are associated with uh, increased risk for cardiovascular disease, again, including heart attacks, strokes, kidney disease, heart failure, and so forth. 
So what are some of these common risk factors? Um, one question I sometimes get in the office from patients who have high blood pressure is, you know, what role does family history or genetics play? And that's kind of another whole conversation, but in short, it's, it's complicated. The relationship between genes and, blood, and high blood pressure is very complex. Just because your parents or your siblings have high blood pressure doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get it, but vice versa, just because you don't have a family history of high blood pressure doesn't mean that you're immune from it. There are a lot of other factors and uh, uh, causes at play. Um, overweight and obese, uh, people who are overweight and or obese, um, there have been shown that they're at higher risk for developing high blood pressure along with these other um, heart, uh, cardiovascular diseases. One thing that um, we have more control over, obviously, you know, we can't change who our parents are, but one thing we can uh, have control over and manage is our dietary salt or sodium intake. And that has definitely an association with high blood pressure. Um, you know, I hear a lot of patients in the office, they say, well, you know, doc, I don't use the salt shaker at all. And my response generally is, well, that's, that's great and that's commendable and you should continue uh, not using the salt shaker. Problem is in today's kind of uh, society, Every, a lot of foods that we buy or eat already come with a lot of salt in it. Um, you know, if you eat out at restaurants, most of the foods probably has a good amount of salt in it. If you buy any kind of processed foods, basically anything that comes in a box from your local grocery store, if you look at the nutrition panel, probably has a good amount of salt in it already prepared. Other risk factors include uh, a sedentary or inactive lifestyle, uh, kind of a, a couch potato uh, uh, philosophy. Um, and in addition, excessive alcohol consumption as well as smoking have also been associated with high blood pressure. Again, these risk factors are, um, you know, th they're not only associated with high blood pressure, but with other diseases that's all tied in with uh, cardiovascular disease in general. So you may be asking, well, why, why is high blood pressure dangerous? Why do we care if patients have high blood pressure? In short, and in, in summary, the risk of heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, kidneys, kidney disease, all increase as your blood pressure increases. And to put a number on it, basically each 20 point, a 20 point higher systolic blood pressure, again, that top number, and a 10 point higher diastolic blood pressure, again, that bottom number, is associated with a two-fold increase in risk of death from these cardiovascular diseases, which is obviously a significant, uh, significantly higher risk. So now we know a little bit about high, what high blood pressure is and what is associated with it. What can we do to prevent it or to treat it if you already have high blood pressure? And this slide, again, I'll kind of break down in a little more detail in, in, um, in the next few slides, but just wanted to show this um, as uh, a list from the uh, guidelines and most recent recommendations about non-medication approaches to what you can do to reduce your risk of having high blood pressure or to lower your high bl uh, blood pressure if you already have hypertension. And again, we'll talk about each of them individually. So diet is a big, uh, plays a big role in high blood pressure as well as cardiovascular disease. Um, the, there's a, actually a diet that's recommended by the American Heart Association um, for people with high blood pressure, and its acronym is DASH diet, which stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And um, essentially, the, the main principle of the diet is that it's a uh, diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, uh, lean meats, fish, poultry, nuts, and maybe more importantly is what the diet tries to limit. And th those things include uh, red meats, 
highly processed foods with refined sugars and uh, saturated fats, cholesterol. So those are the things that um, should definitely be uh, taken in moderation as part of this diet. And studies have actually shown that this diet is, um, can reduce your blood pressure by more than 10 points, 10 or 11 points, which is a significant decrease. And that's without medication. That's with this diet alone. Other things associated with diet is, you know, I touched on earlier, salt intake. Um, reducing your salt intake will have a beneficial effect on your blood pressure. Um, the optimal recommendation for salt intake on a daily basis is less than two grams a day. Um, and it's, it, to be honest with you, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. I tried to do it for uh, two weeks and it takes a lot of not only discipline, but arithmetic skill because you have to kind of keep track of everything and you almost have to prepare most of your meals from uh, fresh ingredients. Um, but if you're you know, able to stick with this, it can uh, reduce your blood pressure by five or six points. Increased potassium intake, which a lot of um, patients may not know, have also been associated with a beneficial effect on uh, blood pressure. And the recommendation is generally anywhere between four to five grams a day of potassium. And the recommendation for that is not so much you go out and start taking potassium pills, but increasing your dietary intake of that. And you, you may ask, okay, what's, what are foods that are high in potassium? Things, again, this is a common theme here, fresh fruits and vegetables, certain fish, nuts, soy products, so forth. Along the lines of lifestyle and diet, kind of physical activity go hand in hand. Uh, again, the recommendation from the American Heart Association is for people to get about 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity. And, you know, people ask, well, what, what, is, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you have to go out and start training for the Philadelphia Marathon tomorrow. Moderate intensity activity is anything like walking briskly around the neighborhood or in the mall in this weather. Um, ballroom dancing, doubles tennis, those are kind of activities that are, um, uh, that you can do to increase your aerobic exercise. And that has been shown to decrease your blood pressure by anywhere between five to ten, uh, five to eight, I'm sorry, points. Weight loss has also, is also a, a beneficial thing to do, uh, not only for blood pressure, but also for, you know, diabetes, cholesterol, and a host of other things. And uh, it's been shown that for every kilogram, which is about a little more than two pound weight loss, that's associated with a one point drop in blood pressure for every two, pound weight, two pounds of weight loss. And alcohol intake, moderation of that uh, can improve your blood pressure. The recommendation in general is for men to not consume more than two drinks a day and for women, not more than one and that can reduce your um, blood pressure by a handful of points as well. Medications, obviously a lot of people um, you know, require, on top of, I think the lifestyle changes that I talked about, the non-medication approaches, that should be the foundation of any management approach uh, to high blood pressure. But a lot of people, you know, they have high blood pressure, still have high blood pressure, despite all those lifestyle things. So that's where kind of medications comes into play. And um, obviously, you know, you should always talk to your doctor about what medication is appropriate and when should you start it and so forth. But generally speaking, a person with what's called stage two high blood pressure. So stage one is anything above 130 over 80. And stage two is anything above 140 over 90. So if you have stage two high blood pressure, that's probably you know, a time to start medications. Obviously there may be exceptions, but that's a general rule of thumb. I mentioned earlier kind of the goal blood pressure, that number to have in mind is 130 over 80. Again, this is lower um, in the most recent guidelines than what you may have heard from your doctors and nurses in the past. And I'll finish up uh, with a few slides about certain special kind of patient populations. So uh, women, the prevalence of high blood pressure is, a, is actually lower in women than in men until about the fifth decade of life. And then after that, the uh, prevalence of hypertension is actually higher in women, which 
um, you know, is, is a pretty interesting fact. The, but otherwise, the management and approach to high blood pressure is not much different when it comes to women than the men, except obviously if, if um, you know, in pregnant patients. African-Americans. So African-Americans are particularly affected by high blood pressure. They have uh, not only a higher prevalence of high blood pressure when compared to other races and ethnicities, but the complications and issues that arise from having uncontrolled blood pressure are also more prevalent and more common in African-Americans. They're, you know, I put on there, they're at um, one and a half time more risk of heart failure, stroke, four times greater risk of kidney disease. So all these, so they're particularly impacted. And, um, you know, we talked a lot about salt. African-Americans tend to be more sensitive to salt. And the other uh, uh, difference is that certain medications may be more effective than African-Americans as compared to other races. Again, you know, the individual medications should be discussed with your, with your physician. And diabetes. So 80% of adults with diabetes also have high blood pressure. And high blood pressure is um, at least twice as common in diabetics than non-diabetics. So having either high blood pressure or diabetes. Last year, this talk was about diabetes. And we, we kind of talked about how if you have diabetes, that puts you at higher risk of having cardiovascular disease. This year, we're saying if you have high blood pressure, it puts you at higher risk for having those diseases. Well, it's not surprising that if you have both, your risk increases dramatically than if you had either one. Um, so and these two things often you know, go hand, hand in hand, and the things I talked about in terms of lifestyle things um, would be beneficial for both. So my last slide is just some take home messages. Uh, I think that, you know, it, it's pretty clear at this point that high blood pressure is uh, not only very common, but puts people at higher risk for having cardiovascular disease. And things that you can do to decrease your risk for developing high blood pressure, or if you already have high blood pressure, ways to manage it, includes watching your diet, being more active, uh, losing weight if you're overweight, not smoking or drinking excessively, and of course, um, supplemented by medications if that's needed. Thanks very much, I'll see you guys at the end.